Welcome back, my friend. I have already received word from Alfino. To think that Flame Marshal Huayu was the Galian agent. I know not what to say. Together with Robon, Eline lent us much needed aid at the time of our order's founding. She was particularly passionate about the need to tackle the primal threat. When we discussed the subject, her eyes fairly shone with determination. Whatever else she may have been, I choose to believe that it was her true self with whom I spoke then. But now is not the time to dwell on such matters. I have an important announcement to make regarding our effort to defeat the Asians. We shall begin as soon as everyone is assembled. My thanks for coming, friends. Moonbreeder, the floor is yours. By now, I'm sure you're all familiar with White Aurasite, the miraculous material that'll allow us to capture Asian souls. Back at Snowcloak, we verified its ability to absorb vast amounts of ether. Alas, it leaves something to be desired in the area of stability. The stone can only store ether for a short while before expelling its contents. In addition to Aurasite's inherent limitations, we must needs be wary of our enemy's strength. Our foe draweth upon an infinite wellspring of power. Even should we succeed in entrapping him, the stone will not long contain his wrath. Meaning that, if we want to kill the swine, we'll have to be quick about it. Tis our belief that an Asian soul may be permanently undone, if smitten by a sufficiently concentrated burst of pure ether. The only trouble is, we can't say for sure how concentrated the burst needs to be. Without knowing how much ether an Asian soul is composed of, we're basically guessing. Our sole clue lieth in thy struggle with La Habrea. During that encounter, Heidelin bid you forge what she called a blade of light, a weapon which took the form of a luminous stream of energy. Based on your description, we believe the blade with which you vanquished your foe was composed of ether. Admittedly, your victory proved ephemeral, as La Habrea was able to use a crystal of darkness to flee into the space that lies between our world and the void. The fact remains, however, that Heidelin placed the means to destroy the Asians in your hands. Be that as it may, it would be unwise to assume that she will do the same when we next encounter such a foe. Quite so, my lady. We must needs find the means to forge our own blade of ether, one to equal that which Heidelin did benevolently bestow upon her champion. That is all well and good, but it seems to me that producing such a blade will require a prodigious quantity of ether. Whence will it come, pray tell? Um, oh, what if we had two pieces of white orosite? One to trap the Asian, and the other to store the ether for the blade. Oh, nice try. But it's as I said, the stone won't hold ether for any length of time. We'd still need to collect the stuff there and then, sorry to say. And therein lies the rub. Finding a way to create the blade whenever and wherever we choose. It would seem more research is in order. I'm going to linger a while, perform a few more tests on the aura site. And I could do with some help. Orianger, why don't you lend me a hand? M mine apologies, but I am required at the Waking Sands. Lady Minfilia hath given me sole charge of the premises. It would be unseemly to leave them unattended. Sole charge, you say? So you're basically alone there, then? Well, that settles it. I'll just have to come to you. While you were afield, word arrived from the Charlian Motherland. You will recall that a survey party was dispatched to investigate the incident at the Isle of Val. What they discovered was troubling, to say the least. According to the report, the Isle has been erased from existence. 
was as if a hole had been torn in the very fabric of reality. Aye, yet the mystery endeth not with the Isle's disappearance. It hath come to light that a number of scholars in various other locales were reported missing at a similar juncture. What's more, they all had something in common with the head of the students of Baldessian. Every last one of them was researching a phenomenon called dimensional compression, or the rejoining as the ancient texts call it. I'll be damned if that's a coincidence. All indications suggest Asian involvement. But I sense that a force greater still is at work. The entity the dark beings call the one true god. We must pray that my dear friend Kryle regains consciousness soon. If she bore witness to the Isle of Val's final moments, she may be able to shed some light on this mystery. Following the Calamity, the forces of the 14th Imperial Legion entrenched themselves in strategic locations across Eorzea. So swiftly did they accomplish this, it was suspected that they had received help. To think that it came from Huayu, my right hand. There is more. We have reason to believe that Huayu didn't deal exclusively with the 14th. She also answered to a higher authority in Golomol. But this higher authority could not have been the Emperor. By consenting to the media project, Solus Zos Galvis showed himself to be more concerned about preventing the spread of primal influence than claiming Eorzea for the Empire. He would happily have seen the lot reduced to ash. We believe a number of high-ranking figures within the royal household were against the decision, but that they knew better than to oppose the Emperor openly. Of course, this didn't prevent them from making clandestine provisions, in which Huayu played a part. Alas, these provisions did not prevent Dalamud from falling, and the ensuing chaos changed the face of the realm forever. Yet Eorzea survived. To all intents and purposes, the Meteor Project had failed, and the Empire was left to rue its lack of a decisive means to eliminate the Primals. Until, that is, it stumbled upon the Ultima Weapon. Even before the accursed thing was dug up, it seemed to me the 14th had the might to overwhelm our weakened armies. Yet they chose to hide behind their walls. Why? The Black Wolf was wary of making the denizens of Eorzea desperate, lest more primals emerge to bleed the land. The discovery of the Ultima Weapon, however, emboldened him to resume his war of conquest in earnest. But there was one in Garlemal who believed that Van Belsar's actions were premature. One who stood higher in the Imperial Army's chain of command. He ordered the Legatus to halt his advance, only to find that the Black Wolf had slipped its leash, and that the 14th now acted alone. In a bid to bring Van Belsar to heel, he used the agent he had planted in Ulda prior to the Calamity to undermine the Legion's efforts. A man who outranks Van Belsa, yet opposed the late Emperor's decision to annihilate Eorzea. This could only be the former High Legatus of the Galian army, now known as Emperor Voris Zos Galvis. So he was Huayu's true master. But one of several in actual fact, We've learned that even as Huayu served the Empire's interests, she sold Imperial secrets to a certain faction in Eorzea. In so doing, she helped to maintain the status quo, thus prolonging the conflict. Considering who stands to profit from war, it isn't hard to imagine who her other masters were. Seven Hells! You mean to say that she was a double agent? Huh, triple, if you consider her services to Van Belsar and the new Emperor as separate. 
As neatly as these pieces seem to fit, one aspect of the puzzle remains unclear to me. By whose will was the Marshal feeding intelligence to the heretics? And try as I might, I fail to see how aiding their cause would profit either her Imperial or Monetarist masters. Could it be that another hand is at work here? If so, why you must be made to reveal whose it is. <sighs> Not only have I lost a trusted friend, now I must interrogate her as a stranger. Not a pleasant task, I grant you, but a necessary one. Unless we weed out the ivy, root, stalk, and stem, it will simply grow back. I know that full well. Those closest to Huayu have already been detained, and I will question them alongside her. General, pray keep in mind that there may be unwitting abettors among them. All will be treated fairly. On that you have my word. Those who are innocent have no cause to fear. You have ever been a friend of truth, General. I hope the unpleasant task of weeding out falsehood will not detain you too long. Though it be for the sake of Eorzea, doubting one's comrades is poison to the soul. And with that, I take my leave. All these years. I've been made to dance to their tune. How could you, Huayu? How could you side with... them? Those cankers! Who take from this land and give naught in return! Who use their power to disempower and grow fat while the people starve! I know you can hear me, monitor and scum! Your crimes will not go unpunished! I will purge this land of your sickness before the eyes of the Twelve. I swear it! I shall have no further need of you this day. Your Grace. I fear that not even mine own chambers shall remain private for long. Has the situation grown so grim? Ever since he proposed the Cardinal Reclamation Bill, Telegi Adelegi has risen to greater prominence upon the backs of impoverished refugees. The Monetarists were ever united in their pursuit of profit, but the man's actions have torn a rift in their ranks. They snap at each other as rabid dogs. Yet now is not the time to be bickering among ourselves. If this bickering is a threat to law and order, might you not have grounds to dissolve the Syndicate? Would that the solution were so simple, Admiral. Alas, my moving to dissolve the Syndicate is certain to spark outrage among the influential merchant class, whom the Cabal represents. This would serve to exacerbate the current unrest, and peace would slip still further away. Be they rich or poor, natives or refugees, all who reside in Uldar have a right to pursue happiness. It is the duty of a ruler to protect this right. If I am to perform my duty, I must needs tread warily. It would not do to make enemies heedlessly. Were Lord Lolorito here, he would doubtless say that I have my head in the clouds. A ruler is required to take a wide view. Try as we might to cater to all needs, some will inevitably be overlooked. As such, there shall ever be citizens who feel aggrieved. It cannot be helped. But as you have informed us, the Monetarists take no view but their own. They hunger for power while the masses starve. In the absence of a common cause, it seems beyond any one individual to make Uldar whole. 
and the presence of a Galian agent within the immortal flames only makes matters worse. Even accounting for Uldar's historic reliance upon mercenaries, such a grievous breach of security is unprecedented. I fear this business will provide the monetarists with a rod to beat Rauban. Eorzea can ill afford for the immortal flames to be dampened now. Ere long, the Garleans will turn their ravenous gaze toward our lands once more. If we are to resist their might, our nations must stand together. Yet for this to happen, our nations must be whole. Cannot be done to improve the situation in Ulda. The true wealth of Ulda lies in the health, happiness, and hopes of her citizens. Alas, the citizens shall never know these things, so long as their lives are ruled by the ambitions of the few. The monetarists claim to represent the best interests of the people, but in sooth they desire only to manipulate them for their own selfish ends. For the government to serve the people, it must be formed of the people. For Ulda to move forward, it is not only the Syndicate that must be dissolved. Nay, you jest. My friends, it was for no other reason than to make known to you my intent that I requested your presence here. When I make my declaration to the people, chaos shall inevitably ensue. As the last monarch in the line of Ul, I make unto you this request. Help Roban to preserve order and protect the people. Forsake them, and you forsake yourselves, for a strong Eorzea will ever have need of a strong Ulda. Your Grace, are you certain of this? There is no other way. When the time is ripe, the nation shall become a true republic. Both royalists and monetarists shall cease to be. Uldar will no longer belong to kings or queens or merchant princes, but to her people. Roban, forgive me for casting aside all that you have toiled for in my name. Beyond this gesture, I am powerless to help my subjects. <laughs>